we consider the top 20 oil spills between 1967 and 2007, then on average, every year, 63,000 tons of oil are spilled into our oceans. That is the same weight as the average large cargo ship, as you can see on the screen. Though the size and number of spills is declining, just in the year 2012 alone, there were seven medium-sized oil spills, averaging 100 tons of oil per spill. Interestingly enough, as big as the numbers appear to be, tanker and pipeline oil spills only account for an estimated 8% of oil spilled into our oceans yearly. In fact, small-scale oil spills are said to be sort of like death by a thousand cuts. I don't think Austin or myself ever expected to be playing in pools full of oil, or my personal favorite, transforming a classroom into a factory. Between our friends and family, and teachers letting us have the class for an occasional 10 minutes, we had a fully working, virtually zero-cost assembly line. Just imagine your kid coming home one day, and you asking, hey, Jimmy, what did you learn today? Only to have him start to ramble on about building some weird thing that picked up oil. Talk about transforming learning into the real world. If any of you in the audience today who helped get us to this point, we really must say thank you. This idea started two years ago. I'd competed in science fairs for the four previous years and wanted to continue. By that point, I wanted something I was truly passionate about, an idea that would help change the world, or at least help counteract our inability to sustain the ecosystem. Let's just see a show of hands for a second. Who drives a car almost every day? Who currently has a furnace in their home? Who takes the ferry occasionally? Who's upset with how high gas prices are? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you look around, this by itself proves that oil is one of the largest, if not the largest and richest industry and resource on the planet. Now I knew I wasn't going to create the next generation of electric hybrid cars, and couldn't even if I tried. But oil recovery was something that sounded plausible. Interestingly enough, I had been following the BP oil spill and aftermath for a few years because of a presentation back in social studies. I knew the impact of that one spill, but had no idea what the actual cleanup process entailed. The internet expressed how massive, but surprisingly under the radar, oil spills were compared to things like global warming. I tried to contact a professional in the field, but trying to contact someone in charge of oil spill recovery was like trying to hit a pinata while blindfolded. The one fact that seemed to be clear was that getting someone out really depended on the size and location of the spill. And whoever gets cold requires time to get there with the proper equipment. This, in my mind, was unacceptable. Right then, I decided that I wanted to create something that would be able to clean up an oil spill. But I knew I had to start small. I wanted to create something that was small, inexpensive, and easy for boaters to have on board. So I looked at using a natural material that would be able to clean up the spill. After a year of experimentation, I was able to develop a pad that could pick up 50 milliliters of oil per gram of fiber. It had amazing recovery time and results, but I knew there was still room for improvement. I, too, am a science fair junkie. I've competed in the Canada-wide science fairs twice now. And since I'm a year younger than Vicky, I hope to go again for my last year in 2015. Now, as I heard of Vicky's idea at the start of last year, I had a vision for something bigger. Her original idea was amazing, but had not yet reached its full potential. Being friends for several years before and gaining each other's trust, we decided to form a partnership because we knew we could create something far more advanced with the blending of two minds. Now, my inspiration to work alongside Vicky in the fight for oil spill recovery sparked when oil spills became a huge concern in the local news. The massive controversy over the Northern Gateway Pipeline proposal was at an all-time high, and it had everyone on the edge of their seats. Although it would be a triumph for the oil industry, the environmental risk was extremely high. Even the skeptics were saying that it wasn't a matter of if, but when an oil spill would occur if it was put into place, and that scared me. I didn't get how something so massive could be put into place without even thinking of proper safety precautions or having 100% guaranteed and effective oil spill products being readily available. It's situations like these that make us realize that as our world advances by the second, our ecosystem risks being thrashed by an economy often lacking empathy. Corporations lie and dance around necessary precautions to keep our Earth alive and healthy with only their shareholders in mind. After some long days of researching, with the gracious help of our mentor teacher, Cheryl Nye, we decided to set down the blueprints 
to convert the pad into a 3D model of a fully functioning and eco-friendly oil boom. Now, some of you might be here saying, what the heck is an oil boom? I have no idea what that means. Well, let me clarify. An oil boom is a cylindrical-shaped device that is usually made up of fibers or plastics. It is laid in a circular motion around the spill to stop it from dispersing. It usually has to last for a matter of days to weeks because it is the first thing that's put in there. And it's pretty much its sole job is to stop the spill from getting any bigger. It takes time for actual absorbent products to come and absorb the oil spill. So what's the difference between ours and the standard design? Well, we wanted to harness those extra few days that booms are in the ocean without it picking up any oil. Why not have an oil boom that could trap the spill and also absorb the oil? Because that would be the key to its efficiency. So what we wanted to do was turn away from using non-biodegradable plastics like they usually use on the market that are strictly for spill containment and find an eco-friendly and natural fiber that could not only maintain trapping ability but exceed conventional pickup rates. With this in mind, we created our latest prototype after 11 months of experimentation and research. It can now pick up 32 times its weight in oil and trap the spill at the same time. 98% of this oil can be reobtained by rinsing out or simple pressure and can be refined for secondhand use. Our university lab results suggest that it is fully biodegradable and is extremely inexpensive, a mere fraction of commercial products, which in our eyes, was a dream come true. The most amazing thing to come out of this project was definitely the adventure. Entering science fairs may sound like a boring pastime. When I first thought of science fairs, I thought of what you see in the movies, with baking soda volcanoes, or a typical moldy bread project. But science fair is so much more than that. It's an incredible way to share what you're passionate about and to those who have similar interests. Our introduction to science fair began in middle school with our science teacher, Cheryl Nye. Her passion oozed from every word and enticed even the most science-dreading student. After our introduction to regionals at the University of Victoria, we were hooked. Austin and I both wanted to come up with our own individual projects due to our competitive natures and never considered working together. For each of us, the moment we stepped into the auditorium was like facing our arch nemesis. <laughs> Out of that experience came the realization that in many ways, our passions for science were identical truly an addiction. And to our surprise, after we attempted helping each other out, we melded effortlessly into one vision. Our first step as a team was setting our overall goal to earn a spot to the Canada-wide science fair. But first, we had to get past regionals. The mindset we had going into that level of competition showed what we were as a team, how effectively we worked together while still having fun. At the end of the fair, we had placed first overall earning a spot to nationals this past May in Windsor, Ontario. After many late nights and further testing, we were off and on our way. Having been to nationals before, Austin and I both knew that some of the most memorable moments were in presenting to the public, other students, and professors with experience in your field of study. We were challenged to the extent of our knowledge during judging, and giving suggestions that carried us beyond our own comprehension. Overall, it introduced a whole new level of excitement showing us that other people could be just as excited about our project as we were. It also inspired us to follow our love for science into university and hopefully turn our passion into a career. Thinking about nationals, we don't go straight back to meddling and winning awards. Rather, the friendships made and unforgettable experiences. <laughs> Going to nationals was like meeting a family you never knew you had. The quirks were boundless, pranks unheard of, and warm welcome never missed as much. Let's jump back to the problem. The most crucial thing about the oil industry, that no matter how much money is realized as a result of product demand or how much convenience we achieve, it will never justify the harm it does to our planet. Take the northern Alberta oil industry, for example. It alone uses enough water and electricity for a city of six million people per year. And when you look at these Canadian oil industries, most of the products they use to clean up oil spills are later dumped in toxic waste ponds that can contaminate soil and aquifers. And what about this pipeline that exploded in Los Angeles? It's just more and more and more risk of chemical damage. The pros and cons can be argued, but one thing is for sure. We currently need something more efficient, a better way to do things. Now, some of you might be here saying, well, what happens to the oil that gets left behind in an oil spill? Honestly, it depends on who you talk to. 
it is said that it naturally biodegrades in water. And although the lighter oils do evaporate, making the surface appearance look better, the heavier and denser oil compounds sink as a result of being exposed to UV radiation. The real and scary reality of this is an effect called dead zones. There are over 400 of these all over the world, and what they are is areas in the ocean that have heavily depleted oxygen levels, the biggest of which being off the Gulf of Mexico, which ranges 17,000 square kilometers, and is nicknamed the blob because it looks like a lava lamp, apparently. So although it's not yet proven that they harm wildlife, only microscopic organisms are present. This is one of the fundamental reasons why, as stewards of the ocean, we need to be actively working to eliminate all traces of oil spills, regardless of the size. The dead zones for us, and for many, are where the oceans switch, converge. It tells a story of when humans push a living system past a point to where its chemistry goes wrong and a new one begins. Let's jump back in time for a second to Captain John A. Cabot's journal, a sailor from the 1500s. He used to say how he couldn't even sail because there were simply too many fish in the water. You could simply walk across the water by just stepping on their backs. And although this might have been a slight exaggeration, you can sail for kilometers now without seeing a single one. And most of us want to blame it on overfishing, but oil spills play a huge part in this because what they actually do is suffocate phytoplankton in the water, which are vital protests that provide most of the oxygen in our atmosphere. And whether you're a fish or a human like us, you're not going to survive without a proper oxygen supply. Now, even the government has started to stress this issue. This last month alone, the BC provincial government has granted $20 million to oil spill recovery research and earthquake cleanup. It's so interesting to watch a society realize that all we do is touch with ocean, yet we remain on the shore of what we know. Now, you might be wondering why Vicky's wearing a lab coat and standing over a fish tank. We, <laughs> we brought a small demonstration here to show you on just what our product can do in a couple of minutes. Fun fact, from personal experience, this amount of oil is enough to kill 200 salmon. To us, this is terrifying. So I'm standing here, suited up over a fish tank, to show you just what our product can do in a few minutes. Our pad today that we've made will absorb motor oil from fresh water. By simply running the pad we've made over the oil, it instantly absorbs the oil. Ideal qualities for an adsorbent are to be hydrophobic and oleophilic, meaning that it has a preference for the oil over the water. Though we can't say that our product is completely hydrophobic because it does pick up some water, it's not necessarily a bad thing, because there means, it means there's still room for improvement. Normally, the pad would be left to sit in the oil and s clean up the spill. But already, you can just see its capabilities. Just by wiping it over, it's sucked up here. Normally, the pad would be left for longer. But as you squeeze it out, almost all of the oil can be recovered from the pad. As you can see here, it's almost completely clean. But because we wanted something that was completely environmentally friendly, we wanted 100% of the motor oil to be recovered. And so we found that by rinsing the fiber in an edible oil with a lower density, the oils actually switch place, as the fiber has a preference for the lower density oil. You can see there, the oil is just squeezed right out of it. By using a second oil rinse, it's cleaned even more. As you can see, the pad's almost visibly clean again, with very little residual motor oil left in the fiber. We have really only skimmed the surface of what we could achieve with this product. If you take into account how we use... <laughs> yeah, now you guys get it. There we go. There we go. <laughs> it took me a while, too. <laughs> if you take into account how we used a grade-A classroom, some hours in a university lab, and a budget of $500, I would say we've done well. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's still more. There's still more. <laughs> so basically what we're going to do is we filed a patent, and we're trying to contact companies because we want to fight for larger, test, larger testing facilities and work towards the utilization of professionals in the field. 
But the most important thing that we took out of this entire experience was that if you have an idea, a dream, something you notice just waiting to be explored, don't let anyone ever tell you that that's not possible. We need individuals like every single one of you here today to look to the next generation of scientists, inventors, to help change our world and for the better. Whether you're creating the next cure for cancer or setting a stepping stone for oil spill recovery systems, we need fresh eyes, ideas that don't hesitate to take the path less traveled because we've inherited a world that needs progressive and creative solutions. Now, there's so many global problems that we can wind up feeling helpless, but by picking one close to home, it's a huge first step, one that you're passionate about, whether it's big or small, that you think can make a difference. For us, it was a distraught feeling of watching our oceans be destroyed by oil contamination. And our question to you is what in your life makes you question the world around you? Our passions prompted us to successfully combine our willingness to save the environment with our addiction for science. And for that, we cannot be more grateful. But we have one last request for all of you here today. Help ignite the fire in our generation and those still to come. Because together, we can and we will innovate and engineer our future. Because what better legacy is there for all of us than leaving the world better than we found it? Thank you. Thank you.